So the last verse we sang there, thank you, by the way, Wes, those were great worshipable, worshipful hymns to start with. The last verse said, O worship with singing and glad voices raise. O glorify, magnify, our God is near. Draw nigh, bow before him in reverence and praise. O come, let us worship, the Savior is here. So that, I thought, fit well with what we heard last night of how God wants to be near. He wants to be our shepherd, and uh, he's a personal God. I very much enjoyed that message last night and looking forward to another one um, brought to us tonight by Brother Conroy, all the way from uh, Wisconsin, across the Great Lakes. And uh, we'll uh, keep praying for him here that God could use him again to speak to us. So as in, for an opening, we'll uh, turn to Ezekiel chapter 37 and uh, look at the uh, first 10 verses here. Ezekiel here is having a vision, dream, or of something like this where he sees things where God takes him and shows him. And uh, it has, I think, application for us today. It, it maybe still be prophetic for the future, or maybe it, it was already fulfilled, uh, at least partially, in, the, uh, in, in life being, coming forth when Christ came. I'm not sure, but it has application, I believe, for us today. We're going to read verses 1 to 10. Ezekiel 37, the hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again, he said unto me, prophesy upon these bones. And say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you. And ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise. And behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then he said unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, Prophesy, son of man, say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. So a couple things here. Outside of Christ, before we are uh, redeemed by the blood of Christ, we are, we are like this valley of dry bones. We are but dry bones. There's no life within us, and, and uh, we can't... Um, walk in the spirit and walk as God would have us do and then um, his spirit moves in when he redeems us and there's life breathed into us but sometimes even in our in our daily journey in our walk of life we might feel like dry bones like we um, are kind of living in survival mode and we don't have the joy of the Lord filling us and, and we feel like there's not a lot of life left in us, and the, maybe even the bones are separated and dried up. And, and times like these in church life, when we gather together for a weekend, we, we expect to sit again and be renewed and refreshed, and, and for um, prophecy to be given over us so that we can again experience life within us. So I, I I'm looking at this passage from that aspect tonight. As we sit here together, um, God brought Brother Conroy here in our midst to prophesy over us, and I trust that we can experience that life, that spirit of God within us to move us and to 
bring us into a relationship with him and to fruitful life for him. At this time, we'll have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity again to gather together in this way. We thank you for the blessing it is to be able to sit under uh, your word and to be refreshed in it. Thank you for br bringing Brother Conroy and his family here and uh, watch over them as they are in our midst. Give uh, Conroy strength and grace to be able to prophesy over us and deliver your word to us. May we again experience your breath, your life within us so that we can be renewed and go out and, and display godliness to the people around us, our families and the communities we live in. Guide and direct us to service, and may your blessing be here with us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we'll have a song now, the theme song. And then after the song, I'll just invite Conroy up, and I'll have prayer with you before you begin.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity again to gather here and hear your word preached to us. Be with our brother Conroy as he shares with us. Uh, Anoint him with your spirit and give him strength and courage and wisdom and clarity of mind. And be with us as an audience to have hearts that are broken and open to your truth. And may it change us and allow us to be um, more like you and to grow in our Christian journey. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, greetings in Jesus' name. Did you enjoy the beautiful day today? I did. Such a gorgeous gift from the Lord. And I appreciate the, the invitations that we received today. I really enjoyed the fellowship. I also enjoyed the study. And I appreciate the songs that were led. Thank you very much for that. Um, I worship the Lord. I'm not sure exactly how that song went, but a song of worship. You know, I marvel many times you... You seek the Lord and you, and you ask him, Lord, what, what is it? And you, you sense the Lord leading and, and then you come to service and you, you hear songs and you hear comments being made and, and you just feel like God is not the only one that's spoken to you about a certain subject, but he's also spoken to others. Yesterday we talked about, and like I shared, the overarching theme this weekend, uh, loving our God, our God, he is alive, like we sang. Last night we talked about knowing our God, and that is his heart, as he said in Matthew 22, verse 37, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. God wants us as his people to love him. Tonight we want to look at worshiping our God. Worshiping our God. Maybe you think, well, that sounds... Maybe that sounds boring. I don't know where your heart is at. Maybe you sound that's the most exciting thing that, that I can do is sit in a church service and sing and rejoice. And, you know, we have reason to rejoice, not just on sunny days like this, not just when the colors are pretty. We have reason to rejoice. You know, Job, when God took it all away, what did he say? He said, Blessed be the name of the Lord, right? The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. And he worshiped God. And I think when God saw Job pra- praising him, he, it brought him so much more praise, a lot more praise than he ever received on any sunny day of Job's life. Psalms 103, verse 1. David's words, he says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so thy youth is renewed like the eagles. You kind of get this picture. This was a psalm that David wrote on a very good day, maybe a day in fall when the colors were pretty, maybe a day when he felt like the crops had been bountiful, the day when everything was going well. Maybe that was the day. I don't know. But it seems to indicate uh, David is speaking to his own heart and he's saying, now heart, now soul, listen up. Listen up. I want you to thank the Lord. And sometimes we need to do that for each other. And I hope even tonight that can be something we can experience and encouragement. We have much. We have much to be thankful for. We have much to worship and praise our God for. I sometimes... um, jokingly say obviously not seriously but being a dual citizen i get to be thankful twice a year on canadian thanksgiving and on u.s thanksgiving but you know that's i hope you don't take that seriously uh we should be thankful more than two times a year we have something to thank the lord for every day and something to worship him for even when he takes things away like he did for job So more specifically, I've titled this evening's message, Worshiping at the Right Altar. Worshiping at the Right Altar. Or we could say, with the right heart. So, what do we mean by the right altar? We we know that 
you know, altars in, in the Bible times, altars were always tied to something or someone. Altars were not necessarily always used to praise God. We know there was altars of Baal, right? That was not worship to God. And I believe the same thing is true today. Sometimes the someone or the something that is worshipped in our hearts is not God. And God says in His Word, He is a jealous God and He wants all of our hearts. I'd like to start this evening's message by just giving a little bit of a history on the worship of uh, scriptural um, altar worship. As we know, altar worship started very early on in Scripture. And we don't have a lot recorded throughout Scripture earlier on where altars would have started. We know that uh, soon after Adam and Eve sinned in the, in the Garden of Eden, um, Cain and Abel were born, and that was outside the garden already. As, as I understand, Cain and Abel were born, and, um, 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 and so forth. And altar worship began. We don't have a lot of instructions that God told them. Now, this is how you build an altar right there in Genesis. But later, as we read in Exodus chapter 20, um, we find God gives Moses some instructions on how an altar was to be built. Um, these instructions were given to Moses. We're again jumping back to Moses just briefly here. Uh, maybe you can tell I've recently been going through the Old Testament, but I found a lot of treasures in the Old Testament. And uh, God gave Moses some instructions in Exodus chapter 20 how he was to uh, build an altar and what an altar was supposed to look like and what um, his idea was for altars. So as we know in Exodus chapter 20, the altar was supposed to be built with uncut stones. So we know that were, it's, you know, maybe not necessarily always round stones, but stones that were not cut. That was one instruction that God gave Moses how altars were to be built. It also says that uh, God gave specific instructions in Exodus chapter 20 that the altars that he wanted the people to build and the worship on these altars was not to be shared with any other God. In other words, God and Him alone, He wanted to be worshipped on these altars. Exodus chapter 20, verse 23, in the Amplified, says it this way, You shall not make gods to share with me my glory and your worship. Gods of silver or gold, of, of golds, you shall not make for yourself. So very clear, God told Moses, the altars that you build, I want to be the only one that you are to worship at these altars. So um, uncut stones, that was what God wanted them to do. We also do find, not in Exodus chapter 20, but there was uh, different times in Scripture we find that when they built these altars, they built the altars with 12 stones. So I don't know how many layers they were, um, but they were to take 12 stones uh, and build this altar. Um, the other instruction um, that was given to Moses on Mount Sinai when God told him about building an altar says, it's an interesting note, uh, but God told Moses that they were not supposed to build this altar on top of a platform, something that was up higher. In other words, they were not supposed to have stairs coming up to an altar. And that was for uh, modesty purposes. And so just an interesting note, what God, uh, the instructions God gave Moses on how he wanted uh, the altar to be built. And this was the altar prior to the tabernacle, the altar that would have been in the tabernacle. Now, later in Exodus chapter 27, that's where God again gave instructions to Moses. And this was the instructions that God gave Moses how to build the brass taber uh, the brass altar in the tabernacle. He gave a lot more instructions about how to build this particular altar. It was supposed to be five cubits square, so that's seven and a half feet high and seven and a half feet wide and seven and a half feet, uh, however you draw that. Um, so uh, five cubits high, five cubits wide, and five cubits long. Um, Sorry, I take that back. Uh, actually, it was three cubits high, five by five this way. 
Um, and then God told them they were supposed to put rings, uh, rings on the corners of the altars, and these rings were, um, were there uh, so they could use them for carrying that altar. As you remember, the tabernacle, um, as it was moved through the wilderness, after the tabernacle got, got set up and they would move it uh, throughout the wilderness, they would always pick up these, um, these different instruments within the tabernacle, and they would carry them from place to place. Um, they were supposed to build this, um, this altar out of shittim wood, and everything was supposed to be overlaid with brass. Uh, they were also supposed to build a grate in, um, in this um, um, altar, and uh, not, exor- not exactly sure what that was for. Uh, it could have been something where the ashes could fall through. There was supposed to be a grate. Uh, there was supposed to be four horns on all four corners of this altar. Um, and God also gives specific instructions that this altar was supposed to have a fire burning in it, and this fire was never to go out. We find that detail in Leviticus 6, verse 13. So just a little bit of a history on uh, the altar, and God gave specific instructions for the altar. Now we can maybe ask the question, and, and later Solomon would have built a ta- uh, tabernacle, and uh, not sure if he, if he built a new altar. I do, I do believe he did. Don't have a lot of details about that right now. But God gave a lot of specific directions about this altar. And so we want to ask the question, well, well why? What was the purpose? Why, why did God want his people uh, uh, to build this altar? What was the purpose for the altar? And maybe there's more purposes that you would have. I have three listed here. God wanted a way, and maybe this connects with last night's message some, but God wanted a way. You know, this happened soon after the, uh, the uh, God's people fell. Adam and Eve fell in, fell in the Garden of Eden, and God wanted a way to reconnect or connect with his people. He wanted that relationship, and God is still the same yesterday and today forever. What does that tell us? He still longs for that relationship. God also, I believe, wanted that to be a place where restoration would happen. Do we need times of restoration in our own lives? Absolutely. If you are like they are back in Wisconsin, sometimes we fail, not just sometimes, often, right? We make mistakes, we fail, we stumble, and we need to clear our hearts. Imagine the scenes. Imagine the scenes that took place around altars. Imagine the scenes. I mean, you went... Maybe you went through an entire year and the, and the day came and the priest was going to offer the sacrifice on the altar. You came with all that heaviness of sin and things that you did within the past months or maybe even past year, all that load, all that weight, and you would see and you would, you would witness as the priest would, would perform the sacrifices on the altar and how your sins would be atoned for, restoration would happen, and you'd walk away from that altar uh, you feel like a free man. You'd feel like a hundred pounds fell off your fell off your back. That altar held a very special place in the heart of the people. It was a place where restoration could happen. It was also a place where worship. Many times, when I, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and these were men in Scripture that built many an altar. Remember Abraham. God told Abraham, "Leave your country," and he went and and he went to a land that he never had been before or hadn't been there in a long time. And God says, I'm giving it all to you. And what did Abraham do? He built an altar and he worshiped the Lord. Uh, Jacob was another man. He he ran away from home. He was running for his life. And again, when he met with God, he built an altar and he worshiped God there. And so I'd like to look uh, next at the first three altars that we find recorded in the Old Testament. And what can we learn from them? We're going to look at them briefly. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 3, uh, four and five, we find uh, we find these altars, reco- these first two altars recorded. Again, we know the story; it's the story of Cain and Abel. Um, and the first altar, Genesis chapter four, verse four. If you want to turn it to that in your Bibles, you're welcome to. In Genesis four, verse four. It says, "And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of uh, the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect." In other words, he approved. Or he appreciated uh, that uh, offering unto Abel and his offering. 
So there we have altar number one, altar number two. But unto Cain, unto his offering, he had not respect. He did not approve and he did not appreciate. And Cain was very wroth, or he's very angry, and his countenance fell. I'm not sure exactly what that looked like, but Cain, uh, he became a changed man. There was something about him that changed as he, once he realized that God did not appreciate his, um, his offering. The third recorded um, altar, and by the way, these uh, Cain and Abel, it doesn't really say that they built an altar. It's somewhat of an assumption because they, did they, um, they brought an offering to the Lord. It didn't say that they erected an altar, but we assume they did. Uh, maybe, it's, maybe it's because we saw it in picture books, but very likely because they made an offering to the Lord, um, so very likely they built an altar. It doesn't say specifically that they did, but I take they did. Um, the first actual recorded altar that was built in the Old Testament, we find that in, in Genesis chapter 8, verse 20. This was where Noah, after spending so much time on the water, on the flood, and again, we know the story. It says in Exodus 8, verse 20, And Noah builded an, ar an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said to his heart, in his heart, I will not curse again. Uh, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. For the imaginations of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. Um, so it's, it's very clear in this, uh, in this account with Noah, it says that the Lord smell a sweet savor. Kind of gives you the idea, you know, man, you're out there working all day, and I don't know if you have the privilege to come in at lunch, or maybe it's supper time. You walk in the house, and it's immediately you open that door, and you just smell this, whatever it is, freshly baked bread or, or uh, tacos or something else, right, wafting towards the door, and you just, your, your, your stomach kind of churns with delight. It, this smells good. There's just this pleasantness. This brings you satisfaction. It draws you into the house where your wife is making that, that, um, that sweet or that, that good smelling, well, that's not the right word, um, good scent, right? How do you say that? Um, it's an aroma. There we go. Uh, uh, that wafts, uh, welcomes you in the door. But something, there was a delight that, um, that God had over Noah's uh, offering. It was a sweet savor. It was a sweet aroma. So the question that we like to ask ourselves is, why is God, in these first three accounts, why is God pleased with some altars of worship? And we could say it's, it's not just in these three accounts. But why is God pleased with some? And why are there some altars that God is not pleased with and he does not appreciate? And maybe the answer is very obvious, but I believe it makes a difference who is being worshipped at the altar. Who is being worshipped at the altar? Is God pleased or is he not pleased? We know in the, in the situation with Cain where God was not pleased, I believe it's very clear that the focus of worship for Cain was not God. God was not the focus of his worship. There was something else. I believe there was a self, selfish reason. There was something else that was on his altar that was being worshipped that day. So how do we make this practical for each one of us? Are the altars that you are at, are the altars where you are worshipping, are they sweet to the Lord? Is God delighted? Have you been worshipping the Lord today? Have you been worshiping? Are you worshiping the Lord tonight? Are you worshiping the Lord with your families? In your private devotional life? Are you worshiping the Lord or is there just a going through the motion? These are some tough heart-searching questions that we ask ourselves. We know in the, old, in the New Testament we're no longer building altars out of stone. Or we're no longer going to the tabernacle worshiping around an altar of brass. We no longer have to wait till the end of the year when the priest can offer sacrifices so that we can again have a clear standing with the Lord. 
This is no longer how we, how we approach or how we approach the Lord, or is it? Where is the altar? Where is the altar of worship? Where does that take place? And I think it's very clear. It happens right here, right? Right here. This is where God wants to be worshipped, in your heart and my heart. And I, I, I pled with the Lord even this, this afternoon, saying, Lord, I want my life to, to worship you. I want, your li- I want you to be able to look down at our service tonight and for it to just smell sweet. I really long for that. And I believe that's the heart of God. He desires to be worshipped. And he doesn't desire to share that heart with anybody else. And I know we've heard these illustrations a lot. You know, whether it's marriage or whether it's a relationship with God, God wants everything, everything. He's a jealous God. He wants all of our hearts. And we can't be one foot in and one foot out. We can't worship at two different tables. or at, at, We can't try to worship God and something else. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, a couple verses from the New Testament. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16 and 17. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God? And the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. So notice as we read these few verses out of the New Testament, we read verses like living sacrifice. We read verses, two verses that have the word temple in it. Do you see the connection? sacrifice, temple, those are Old Testament terms. And yet here it's bringing it into the New Testament and saying, I was pointing forward to a day when this was supposed to happen in your hearts, but today it's where I want my worship to happen and it is in your life. It is in your heart. I want you to worship. I want you to give yourself as a living sacrifice. I want my worship to take place in your bodies. Is God worshipped? Is your life sweet to your maker, to your Lord, to your God? Are you worshipping God in your hearts? Verse 17, it says, If any man defile the temple of God. How do we do that? How do we defile the temple of God? And I think you all know what I mean. How do you defile your, the heart temple in your life? I had to think about Old Testament uh, sacrifices again. Soon after God appointed Aaron and his sons to, to take over the temple sacrifices and so forth, Aaron had two sons that were helping the temple. Leviticus 10 verse 1 and 3 gives us account. And I'm not sure how far it was into Aaron and his sons working the temple or doing the sacrifice. But for some reason, Aaron had two sons. And Aaron's two sons, one day, they got a hold of a strange idea. They came up with a plan on their own. And I don't know how they how they came about doing what they did or 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 what all was behind that, or if I only fully understand what what it involved or what it meant. But it says scripture talks about they brought into the temple or they brought in strange fire. Strange fire, something that was foreign, something that did not belong there. They brought that in, and what did God do? He immediately struck them with fire, and he immediately killed Aaron's two sons. In Leviticus 10, verse 3, I believe it is, God says, I will be sanctified, and I will be glorified. This was a very, very harsh if you will but it is the character of God that he showed his people I will be glorified among my people I will be sanctified among my people and I think it got the people's attention more than anything here God struck them dead so instantly because 
They dared to bring in something that was not commanded by God. They dared to bring in something, a strange fire. And I don't fully understand that. Maybe someone here does better than I do. But I don't think that's the point tonight. Are we bringing strange things into our lives? Are we bringing bank accounts? Are we bringing pickups? Are we bringing technology? Are we bringing entertainment? Are we bringing strange fire? Are we, are we replacing what the honor, the attention, the glory that belongs to God with anything else? I think that's the question. That's what we can use to defile the temple of our hearts, the, the, the altar of our hearts. So the question here this evening is, who are we worshiping? Is God worship at the altar of my hearts, or is there an idol? If God would treat us like he treated Aaron's sons, how many of us deserve to be alive? And I have to admit, you know what? Way too often I find myself allowing things to come in. Maybe sometimes just slowly. A compromise here, a compromise there. You know what? Ah, I'm tired in the morning and I don't feel like getting up. Before you know it, it's time to go off to work and I haven't spent my time with the Lord. And by the way, or time with the Lord is not just half an hour in the morning. It's all day. But I do believe there's a time for looking into God's word, for reading, for praying. But it should go, that should just be a platform to start out, to springboard your day, and then to walk with the Lord. But, but in other words, my point is shrugging off, substituting things in life for things of less value. And God is saying, son or daughter, those are not things that I want you to replace me with. That's a strange fire. And I believe it's God's mercy that is keeping us, giving us again and again a second chance. It keeps drawing us, saying, worship me. I want to be worshipped in your life. And so as I thought about that, um, I thought about the word idols. And idols, I mean, I know it's a strain, it's, a, it's maybe a hard word. We don't tend to think that we're into idol worship. Um, but yet, any time we replace anything with God in our lives and we start putting that as our main focus, it really becomes an idol, doesn't it? It's something we replace. And so as I looked at that word idol, it can be interest in our lives. It can be desires in our lives. It can be obsessions. It can be lusts. It can be sins. And there could be a a whole list of other things. Obviously, these two lusts and sins, um, they are not something that God gives. God is not the one that uh, leads us to, to sin or lust. And not even all these, not even interests or desires are necessarily wrong. But if they're not guided or governed by the Lord, or desire for food is not wrong, but if we're not governed, if we just, we're, if we're obsessed with it, with it, or we don't know where to stop, it can be, it can become an idol in our lives. Maybe we don't think about it as an idol, but, but what I, my point is anything that's, there's things that take the place of God, whatever they are, obsessions. Oh, I got to check. I got to check the news. I got to know what's up. Before you know it, your time with the Lord is slipping away and a, a year passes and you might wonder, why, why is my relationship not the same as it used to be? Oh, it's so easy. There's so much at our fingertips. Entertainment and documentaries and research and you name it. There's so much there. Interest after interest. And even just the way we communicate back and forth. I mean, you can, now we've, you know, we're getting, getting to know more people in Ontario, so we might be communicating. <laughs> you know, the, the, the bigger your circle grows, right? You just, you, you, sometimes you're so involved with just keeping up with everybody and it's not all wrong. There's so much good. It's, there's a lot of good in that. But are we finding time? Are we worshiping God? Is He the number one? Is He continues to be the number one in our lives? My next point here that we're going to look at is, it's very clear throughout Scripture, God has commanded us not to make idols. God gave very few words that were actually handwritten by God Himself to His people. But the Ten Commandments were 
handwritten by God's finger and hand it to Moses. What were the, free, the first three Ten Commandments? They were putting, each one of the first three Ten Commandments were putting God in his proper p- uh, place where God wants to be. The first one, thou shalt have no other gods before me. We covered that already, but God is just again clear. I am the only one. There is, thou shalt have no other gods before me. The second one, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. As I read that second commandment, thou shalt make. Uh, what do you do when you're making something? Well, you make bread if you don't have bread, right? You make a garden shed if you don't have a garden shed. And so there is but one God. If you're going to have another God, you've got to make it. And who makes these, God, these gods? The sobering thought is, the sobering thought is, we do. We make those gods. Those gods aren't real, but we sometimes and very often we're tempted to make things in our lives that we worship, things that we replace for God, whatever they might be. We spend so much, we focus so much, we emphasize so much, it becomes so important to us, it consumes so much more time and so much more of our own worship than what God himself does, and they become idols. We start making them. It's not scriptural. There is but one God, and he never needed to be made. He is eternal. He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Isaiah 44, verse 6 says, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Beside me there is no God. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. As we keep reading in Exodus chapter 20, verse uh, Exodus 20, where the uh, Ten Commandments were written, as we keep reading, in verse 5 it says, Thou shalt bow down thyself, thou shalt not bow down thys- thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So this is. The next verse after God has said, don't make any idols. And then he goes on and says, and if you're going to make idols, and if you're going to worship them, I am a jealous God. I'm going to visit that iniquity. Your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren to the fourth generations are going to bear these consequences. It's going to have long-lasting effects, if I am understanding this passage right. The decisions that we as as men and as sisters here are making today, who we are worshiping, what is most important on our hearts? And maybe you are all saying, well, yes, God is most important on our hearts, but really, is He? And I have to admit, many times for me, that's a challenge. I don't place God where He belongs in my heart. And I need these reminders for myself. But... You know, God is loving. He draws us back. And it's okay for us to to admit on an evening like this, saying, Lord, I recognize that I've not had you. I've not worshipped you. You've not had first place in my heart. You haven't always been glorified. My aroma hasn't always been pleasant, been sweet. And I confess I have failed. And I believe God forgives. I know he does. But when you choose to walk and you choose to idolize and you choose to show your family, you know what? Work, that's where things are at. I mean, you earn a good living. You make sure that, that you build a good name for yourself and your community. That's what it's all about, boys. Do what your dad does. No, that's a, re- a very wrong example. We should teach them good ethics. That goes along with Christian living, absolutely. I believe that's part of what we pass on. But your family should, should know without a shadow of a doubt that mom and dad love the Lord Jesus Christ, and he is the most important in our lives. If the church doors are open, if at all possible, we're there. Rain or shine. And I'm not saying, we. I grew up on a farm. I know what it is like. I'm sure there's farmers out here. There are days when, when, when you know, it's, it's hard. It's hard. But for the most part, there was a very few times when we would miss, um, I mean, we, Sunday morning was not, not a question whatsoever, but uh, even a weekday, very seldom we would miss a service. Um, we were at church. And it stuck with me. Dad and mom showed us children it is 
God that takes number one. We're going to worship him. And you know what? I'm bearing the rewards and the blessings because of my parents' decision. But all the, the grief, the pain, the, 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 um, the sadness, the, the, the sorrow that our children will face when all we've done is built them big inheritances um, of money that maybe they don't need anyway down the road. Um, as we continue to keep reading the next verse, this shows the, the opposite sar- side of uh, the consequences. It says here, um, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So this is the opposite. The rewards, the blessings that get pa- gets passed on to our children and to those uh, after us. And I've been blessed by a godly heritage. I trust most of you are. Um, I had a grandpa who we used to, he enjoyed, uh, he loved uh, the Lord and and I was sharing earlier around the supper table or supper, uh, dinner table, whatever it was. He loved the Lord and he enjoyed taking us, his grandsons, out on the street witnessing many times. Or we would go to his house and into the basement and fold tracks. And he handed out thousands and thousands of tracks on the streets of Winnipeg. Um, as he got older, um, he would, um, and I don't know if Emma's listening tonight, but we were visiting her tonight and, and I was just sharing these experiences with her. And, uh, but um, he had a, a little walker, and he would push that walker out on the street, and he'd have a little basket uh, in this walker with a little seat on top of it. He had a little gospel sign that he built and put it right on top of his handle, and he'd push that thing right into the streets of Winnipeg and sit down at an intersection somewhere, and, and he uh, would hand out tracks, and some people threw the tracks away. Others accepted them. Others uh, struck up conversations, and he always said, he always said, we need to have a soul-winning attitude. Just have a soul-winning attitude. That's all you need, to have a soul-winning attitude. It doesn't matter how you do it. Just have a soul-winning attitude. You know, have a smile if you need to have a smile. Hand out a track if you need to hand out a track. Talk to, you know, but have a soul-winning attitude. There's hundreds of ways to have a soul-winning attitude, and that was his spiel. And on the way to, to Winnipeg, we'd have an hour of drive, and he'd be talking, and we'd be praying, and he'd be... By the time we were in Winnipeg, we were all excited. And he would get out and he said, now, now don't expect that you'll have the strength and the power to do what you need to do until you step out of the car. God says he will give power. And when we get to the city, you step out of the car, you go on the streets and God will give you power. And isn't that true so many times? God doesn't give you power for many times for your steps 10 feet in front of you. It's your next step. And isn't that so true? Take your next step. God gives you strength. And he will give you strength for the second step. And, and my grandpa would preach that over and over again on the way to, s- into, to the city. And then when he would get tired, he would sit down on his, on his little stroller there, and then he would sit and keep handing out tracks. And he would pass them out and pass them out until he's, his carts were empty and we would go home. And, and, and it was so rewarding just to know that you've done, uh, um, you, you know, you've served the Lord. And I believe that's uh, also a form of worship. And, um, but showing your children... And there's a blessing that goes along with that. The third um, uh, uh, commandment, or uh, um, yeah, the third commandment, all the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And we're not going to spend much time with this one, but just again, God is saying, telling his people, I want to be, I want to be hallowed. I want to be glorified in your midst. Um, Don't take my name in vain. And sometimes I marvel, and I don't know how it is here in Canada. I'm sure it's the same way. I marvel why is the entire world more and more growing um, anti-religious. I I hate to even say anti-religious, but anti-Christian, anti-God. But more and more you hear them using the name of God in vain. Like, why would you use that? I mean, you could use words like snowball or treehouse or something, you know, instead of using the word God. But why is there power in the name of God? There is something there that Satan is pushing them, saying, use that name. Use that name. I want to step on God again. I want to blaspheme him again. And, all, and it's directly in violation to the very fact that the world around us is using God's name as a swear word is proof to us as Christians. There is proof that there is a God because the enemy is fighting directly against it. The ve- every time you hear that name said, it is proof, brothers and sisters, there is a God in heaven. Otherwise, I, I, I'm convinced uh, people could go around saying any other name. But if, if, if God... If there's, if there's nothing to God, then they could be saying Joe or Sally or any other name. But no, that does not hold 
um, the, the power that does not hold the blaspheme that Satan wants to throw against God. And yet, you know what? How do we handle that as believers? And I said I wasn't going to make this point long. But my grandpa, again, many times how he uh, approached this, he's, when he was in the presence of, of God's name being used in vain, my grandpa oftentimes would respond back to them. He says, he would just, he would just, they would say the name, he would just say, I love him. And they would be like, what? He would kind of stop in the tracks because many people, they don't even think about what they're saying. They use that so flippantly, they're not even thinking about it. It's just everybody does it, and they don't even think about it. And he would say, I love you, and it would stop them in their tracks, and all of a sudden they realize, oh, I have said something here, um, and this is, there, there's a deeper meaning behind that. So just a challenge, and I've tried that the same way, and it is effective. There's, I'm sure there's other ways, but are we glorifying God? And so, how do we, how do we determine, as, as, as believers here tonight, how do we determine, so are we worshiping are at the altar of self or at the altar of the Lord? And I think you know what I mean. Is the Lord worshiped in our hearts or is self being worshiped? Is there something else? Now, with self, you know, we could talk about all kinds of idols. Is it material gain? Is it a reputation that you're trying to uphold? Or is it perhaps a sin, uh, sinful habit? Maybe it's an immoral habit. Maybe it's a sin that you're hiding in your hearts that only you know and God knows. But you're trying to uphold a reputation. Maybe that's what you're worshiping. That you can, it can be a sin in your life that you worship at the altar of self. If somebody comes along and touches what you worship, if somebody comes along and touches your reputation, somebody comes along and touches what you really hold very, very dear, in fact, you're holding it more precious than God himself, how does that affect you, and how does it become evident what you truly are worshiping? The story is told of a man who bought a, bought a new car, or almost new car. He brought the car home one day, parked it in his yard, and walks in the house. Later that day, his daughter, his young daughter, not sure how old his daughter was, just a little tyke. She's walking outside, walking, holding a little wire, piece of wire in her hands. She walks up to this new car and starts holding that piece of wire up against the car, not sure why. Maybe it was fun to see it, reflection in the new paint or something, or watch it scra being scratched. She walks it around that car, makes a couple of really good scratches in that car. The dad pretty soon finds out about what happened. He is furious that this would have happened to his prized car. He takes the piece of wire that this girl had in her hands. He takes a piece of wire and he ties this girl's hands together very, very tightly. In fact, it was tied together so tight this girl lost circulation in both of her arms, her, her hands. And he left them on long enough, this girl ended up losing both her hands. Time went on. I'm not sure how, many time, how much time lapsed. A day came, daughter without both of her hands because of an angry father. Girl's a girl walks up to her daddy one day and says, Daddy, Will I receive my hands back once the car is fixed? I'm not positive how the story ends, but I believe it's a true story as I heard it being told. I believe the father went and committed suicide because he couldn't handle the reality of what he had did. But, you know, I think it's pretty obvious in the story, maybe an extreme illustration, who was or what was being worshipped. And it became very it became more obvious when the, the, the object of what was being worshipped was touched, was being destroyed, was being challenged. Sparks, attitudes, and things started boiling. Anger, extreme anger. You know, sometimes when what we are worshipping, whatever that might be, when that gets touched, when God touches an area of life, maybe there's bitterness of times. Maybe there's something we want so desperately or maybe we lose something that we feel like we really deserve. We become bitter. God, why did you let that happen? And we become bitter at God. 
because we were really not worshiping God, we were worshiping something else. And we lose it and we become bitter. We were, God didn't have first place in our hearts. Other times maybe when we're worshiping something, we know we have a sin problem in our lives and we're worshiping a sin, some kind of a sin, maybe it's an immoral sin. And yet we so want everybody to understand that we're still perfectly good. We cover it up, we hide it, and we become hypocritical. It's another response. We can become extremely discouraged. Retaliation. Somebody does something to us, we lose a lot, maybe material gain, material possessions, or maybe reputation, and we have this feeling of retaliation when we're, all, when we're sacrificing, when we're worshiping at the altar of self when it's not God. Sometimes we're determined that we're going to regain what we've lost, even if it means through dishonest gains, through dishonest means. I had an experience here a couple months ago. I think I told a few of you earlier here, I, I have a sign shop. I do a lot of signs and decals or decals, depending on where you're from. Play with stickers, I tell people. But a couple months ago or so, my main piece of equipment, which is a printer, it, it all of a sudden broke down one day. And uh, I grew up on a farm. We, we, we did oil changes and did some mechanical work on tractors and so forth, but I, I don't know how to fix printers. And uh, I didn't think, I mean, I figured I, I knew how to fix it. My wife figured it out sooner than I wasn't able to, but, you know, I figured, you know, let's get some parts ordered here and fix this thing myself, save a few thousand dollars. Well, after ordering two sets of parts and replacing it and spending a bunch of time, it was more broke than it was before and, and wasted more money than we had before and I was more discouraged than before and customers were waiting for their products more than before and the stress was building and I wasn't producing any income um, and it felt really, really stressful. Basically, it felt like my business was shut down and that was a time of real soul searching. It took about six, six weeks or so, but well, it, Finally, I figured out that I simply was not smart enough to fix this thing. I had to get a technician in there, and he fixed it in a, in a short time. But there was a lot of, it was a soul-searching moment for me, and maybe that sounds funny, a soul-searching time when you have something broke down like a tractor or a combine, but that was my tractor and my combine. It was broke down, and, and stuff needed to happen. There was, there was grain to harvest or at least stickers to be made, and I couldn't do it. Customers called and said, you know, when, are you, when is it ready? And I just said, I'm sorry, you know, I just, it just really felt, it really felt stressful. And, and, uh, and that was a soul-searching time for me. And uh, not that I don't feel like, you know, just because you have stress doesn't mean you're, you're not serving at the right altar. But it was a time saying, where is my business? Am I, why am I so worked up about this? And yet, so many souls around me are dying and going to an eternity in hell. And yet many times I don't find myself being as worked about that. Where am I prioritizing things in life? And am I worshiping my business too much? Am I worshiping my... And I had to bring it to the Lord. I had to commit it to the Lord. And I think you know what I mean, right? You have those times. You have those combines. Those whatever you work with, right? That... You know, stuff happens. Ladies, you have your own things, right? In the house and so forth. These are things that come up and all of a sudden you, you have to stop in your track saying, why am I bitter or angry or why? If I'm worshiping the Lord, I mean, what did Job do? When God took everything away, you know, I think he was stressed. I really do think, and I don't think just because you're having a hard day and you're like, oh, this is difficult. I think if you would have asked Job, he admitted to his friends, he admitted to everyone around, it's difficult, this is really hard. But yet, even if you're hard, even if I believe you go through these stressful moments, and you don't have to admit saying it's all easy, but difficult things don't make us angry or bitter against God. Do you know what difficult things do? They actually draw you closer to God. They make you feel like God is even closer to you. And when Job came through that experience, he felt, I believe he felt the nearness of God closer than what he had ever felt before. And he saw God, he didn't, I mean, he, he didn't realize how God was going to turn things around. He had no idea. But it becomes very evident 
who you're worshiping when God touches the thing you're worshiping. And so if God, if something touches our maker and our Lord, and what touches our maker and our Lord? It's sin, brothers and sisters. Sin. When I sin, when I fail, when I have an immoral thought, when I have an angry thought, when I don't get along with my brothers and sisters, that hurts God. And that grieves his heart. And how does that affect me? David, he was a man after God's own heart, and yet he sinned. And we too, even, after, even if we worship at the right altar, we too stumble and fall at times. And when we realize that we fail, like David did, he said in Psalm 51 verse 4, against thee, the only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. It's godly sorrow. I believe if we're worshiping at the altar of God, when something touches God and that is or sin, there is a sorrow, and it is a good sorrow. It's a godly sorrow. It's a sorrow that brings us back on the right track. And it is a sorrow that comes to God and says, God, against thee, the only have I sinned, and I am sorry. I want to worship you, and I realize I have, I have hurt you. I realize I have pained you. you I have grieved you. And I'm asking you for your forgiveness, for your cleansing. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Though he fall, he shall not be uh, cast down, but the Lord upholds him with his hand. You get the idea. God guides the steps of a good man, but he, if he falls, God picks him back up and we can continue to keep walking. By the way, that's been, become one of my life verses. I, I tagged that one or I thought about that one after I fell in my shop. I shared that last, last night. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. It's kind of a double meaning there. The Lord upholdeth him with his hands. Uh, I feel like uh, there was a physical fall. Uh, it's maybe a little bit of a different twist in that verse, but it feels like it, was, it became special to me. So the two altars. We're going to wrap it up here soon. The two altars. The, qu- the thought that I had as I was thinking about that, you know, many times these two altars outwardly, the two hearts outwardly can look very similar. What do I mean by that? I mean, we can have two people in the same building, like tonight. One is sitting there, his heart is right with the Lord, and God is pleased that that aroma, as that worship, as that meditation, as that open heart before him is just, just open up to the Lord, and he's surrendered to the Lord, and the Lord is being worshipped from that heart. And the other person is sitting there, just as righteous looking, just as... Looks about the same, and yet God is, has a much different uh, aroma coming up from that person. And that's a serious thought, because I know we're not just talking about us here versus the world out there. And I'm not trying to point fingers. I don't know what your hearts are like, but I know what my heart is like, and I know how at times I see my own heart worshiping the things that it shouldn't be worshiping. We know the Pharisee story at, with a publican, they were both in the temple, both in the same spot. They were both, in quotes, praying. Maybe they were both dressed up. Well, actually, the Pharisee, uh, the, the Pharisee was probably really dressed up. The publican probably wasn't so much. Not sure which way it was. God was pleased with the one and the other. God was not pleased with worship from the one, a stench from the other. Is God worshiped at your heart this night? Or is it possible that we're just going through the motions? Is it possible that we're just singing, we're mouthing the songs? We're reading through the words. The words of God are entering into our ears, but it's not going anywhere beyond that. It's never even reaching our hearts. This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, but honoreth me with but honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Well, may our churches serve services or personal and family devotions be more than outward service. May our hearts lift an aroma of worship towards our God. If we're sitting here tonight and we're worshiping somebody else in our, at our heart, on our heart, in our lives, and you know if that's the case, and God is not being worshiped, it's really called idolatry. I know it's a hard word, but idols are anything that are replaced by God. 
And I don't want to throw a heavy weight on your shoulders. Many times just saying, Lord, I just again, I'm asking you just, just take my full worship. Help me just, help me just to glorify you. May you shine your eyes. May, may your glory uh, shine upon my life. May I reflect your glory to those around us. May, may my life just be a channel for you. May you be glorified. Show yourself mighty in my life, Lord. Glorify yourself. It's not about me. It's about you. May that be the heart cry of each one here tonight. So I'd like to end with this last thought. What does God say when we have, if we have struggled with idolatry, and I, and I think every one of us here has, something else, some point in our lives has taken priority in our lives. We've allowed small compromise. We look back. My personal walk is not what it used to be. My walk with the Lord is not as close as it used to be. Something has come in. Some idol has taken over, has started crouching it. Maybe it's small steps, small compromises. And maybe the challenge is, again, just saying, Lord, I don't want that. Scripture says concerning idols, wherefore my dearly beloved flee idolatry. In other words, run away from it. And we know we can't run away from this world. In a sense, this world is surrounded by um, lures, uh, things that we can create idols of. But I believe God can give us the victory. And then 1 John, verse, 1 John 5, verse 21 says, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Dear ch- and and uh, Amplified says it this way, Dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. Let's end with prayer. Lord, we thank you, God, for tonight. We thank you, God, that you are a God that desires to be with your people. And as of tonight, as we've, thought, as we've talked about, worshiping you, Lord. God, I must confess there's times in my life, God, where I have focused on things and allowed things to come into my life, Lord, that did not take, did not keep you as first place in my heart. And I know there are struggles even within this congregation tonight where idols have crept in. And Lord, we just pray, God, that you would give us wisdom. Lord, to like Job, to hold things loosely, to hold things with an open hand, and to receive when you give, but to let go when you take. And God, that you could be glorified in each one of our lives. Lord, we worship you. We want you to be the center of our worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, brother, for sharing that with us. My uh, soul has been refreshed to sit here and uh, look in at <clears throat> my life closely. How am I doing? Am I truly worshiping God? Or are there other things that are taking its place? One of my favorite hymns is, Oh, for a closer walk with God. And the third verse goes like this, The dearest idol I have known, Whate'er that idol be, help me that idol to dethrone and worship only thee. And so tonight, let us um, recommit our walk with God and to dethrone those idols and to worship only God. Let's stand for a closing song. <clears throat>